So let me talk about Heartbleed a little bit. Um, there is a uh, library that is used for security applications called OpenSSL. Uh, for the desktop security stuff, I've talked about HTTPS, which is a secure version of web traffic. Um, and that uses uh, SSL. That's the S in HTTPS is SSL. OpenSSL is a free software library that provides the SSL layer. Uh, it is not the only software out there that provides the SSL layer. Um, however, it is the predominant software. So uh, when we found out that there was an SSL bug, uh, we've also found out subsequently that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the websites on the internet were affected by this bug. So that also tells you how predominant, you know, how dominant uh, this application, this uh, library is. Uh, it is free software, so the advantage we have with this is that people were able to look at the code and find uh, the bug. Uh, we actually had two different groups that found the bug about the same time, um, which led to some confusion for announcements because they didn't they they said, "Oh, other people know about it. We better get the word out because bad people might be using this." Uh, when they thought it was just one group that knew about it, well, let's fix some things first and then announce it. Um, so there was some confusion there. Things happened. Um, but because they were able to study the code, they were able to find the bug, uh, let people know about it. And one thing that's really, really important, uh, not just that they were able to look for the bug and find it, but the SSL project can't hide it. You know, you can't, you can't say, oh, it doesn't exist because, well, we have, we have proof that it exists. And not only that, but we can fix it if you don't want to. Um, which the SSL project didn't do, um, but Shall we say another company that provides uh, uh, internet services recently had a bug that was also a security issue, and they wanted to not claim that the, that the bug was there for a few days uh, before they fixed it. Uh, the SSL bug, the announcement w came out Monday. We had fixes out Monday. We had lots of places updating their software on Monday. We had tools for detecting whether or not your site and your your servers were susceptible on Monday, um, and we had most of the sites fixed with by Wednesday. Um, so we were able to move quickly. That said, it didn't take very long to be able to go grab information. Um, so not picking on a particular company, I just happened to know that they had issues, and it took them a little bit longer to um, get it. Google fixed things quickly. They were one of the groups that found the bug, so they fixed the bug because they thought they knew about it. Uh, Yahoo was not one of the companies that found the bug. It took them a little while to fix the bug. Um, because of the bug, uh, their secure certificate could be pulled off of their web server, which means that now somebody can pretend to be their web server because they have the certificates that's used to claim who they are. They have the key. But not only because could they do that, they could grab other information, like they could grab session information and cookies and authentication credentials. So off of the Yahoo sites and companies owned by Yahoo, so Flickr and Tumblr, I think, are both owned by Yahoo, for instance, uh, somebody could actually be querying the web server and, and saying, give me other information, and thereby be grabbing information from those who have gone through and, and connected. So if you were reading Yahoo Mail, if you were updating, uploading pictures to Flickr, um, then it is possible that, that somebody that was, was trying to break in was able to grab that information. Now they now have your username and password, and they now have access to your account. Um, and they could also be stealing the session. So even if they don't have the credentials, because they have the session claiming to be you, they can now hijack that session and do things with it. So it was a really serious bug. It was it is a very poss is possibly the worst security incident we've had on the internet um, thus far. But it would have been far worse had it not been a free software application that we could go jump on full speed and take care of things. Um, and the people that are actually supporting the SSL website, we should thank them because they have been working for 72 hours now <laughs> going through and, and fixing it and monitoring and looking at previous logs to find out if, somebody, if this had been going on. Now another problem with the bug is that um, you can't actually see it in logs. It doesn't cause errors. Um, they are able to grab information, and uh, the only way you can see it is there's a slight change in a certain type of traffic. And unless you're doing a certain type of logging, which most people, most uh, companies are not doing, you have no way of tracking that. Um, so we can know that sites like Yahoo were susceptible, 
but we can't know if anybody actually used it successfully against Yahoo, other than the people who were proving that Yahoo was susceptible, uh, and whether or not information was, was taken out of that. The bug's been in place for two years, um, so it is possible that this has been being exploited for up to two years, and nobody's known about it because it's not showing up anywhere. So now what does that mean to the average desktop user? For sysadmin, we know what it means. Sysadmin, they have to, they're going to be working for a while. They had to go through and do updates. They had to change out their keys. They had to do a whole bunch of other things to make sure that their sites, their applications are now secure. What does that mean to us that use those applications? So when I, if I log into Yahoo, what do I need to do? I know that my account might have been compromised. Well, what I need to do first is change my password. So I have a new password. And that's actually not the first thing. There's some pieces that go with it. I'll cover that in a second. Um, and then the other thing is I need to look at my account and make sure that nobody's messed with it. Because if, if let's say, uh, uh, instead of Yahoo, it was a place that you buy things from, right? Um, let's say I like vegetarianlambs.com, where you can go buy vegetarian lambs for whatever reason you buy vegetarian lambs. I don't know where you buy non-vegetarian lambs, but you go buy, there, buy vegetarian lambs. So you were looking for lambs on Monday afternoon. You didn't know about the bug. You you created an account. You signed in. You gave them your home address because you want the lamb shipped home, right? Um, you gave them your phone number so they could contact you to make sure it was the right size lamb or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, now, uh, if somebody was able to break into that your account over there, they could add their address and their phone number to your account and be using your credit card to be making orders and getting lambs shipped to their house or to somebody else's house. And unless you look at your order history and look at your account information, you don't have any way of knowing that that's taking place. Even if you change your password, they could still be making orders on your account because they've basically gotten themselves piggybacked onto your account. So you need to change your credentials, but you also need to go through and, and audit your account to make sure nobody else has been added. There's nothing on there that you don't expect. Uh, through other break-ins that have happened the last couple of years, we actually should be doing that on a regular basis anyway, but um, we'll, we'll go there. So um, if you've logged into a secure site in the last, since Monday morning, you should be checking that account and updating your credentials. If you logged into it in the last couple of years, depending on how paranoid you are, you might want to go through and do that as well. Um, but at least if you've done it in this last week. Um, unless you know for certain that the site that in question was not uh, broken into, was not susceptible, and you don't use those same credentials, that same password anywhere else. You use the same password somewhere else, you've been you just counted as broken into because it was compromised in one compromised in one place. They can use that to go get you your account somewhere else. So Google, you're probably safe. If you have a Gmail account, that's probably fine. Um, it's the same thing for YouTube and and, and and other things that are Google. Um, but if you have, uh, you know, Hotmail or, you know, whatever else, so you, as I say, you're buying from, from this vegetarian lamb place, you might want to go check on those. So first, let's talk about what you need to do as an desktop user. So at first, I'd scare you, which is, you know, a good portion. Gets you motivated to do something. Uh, well, I said, I don't know where you get that. So vegetarian lambs, where I know where to get those. I don't know about getting, you know. Uh, so I suppose you could uh, just, you could apply the rabies patch, but all right. Um, so the first thing you need to do is apply security updates to your equipment <laughs> because you need to make sure your equipment is, is secure as well. No point in going through and changing all these things if you're if you're susceptible to the problem. Now this is a problem that affects the servers and not the desktop, but there could be related pieces. There are other software, including desktop software, that uses OpenSSL. Let's just make sure we've got a clean slate to begin with, right? So get your security updates for your desktop, your laptop, your tablets, your phone, anything that you use to log into a secure site with. Um, and then be sp especially concerned about uh, getting updates for your browsers and your email clients. They won't necessarily have one because most browsers were actually not susceptible to this, so they, there's not any security updates related to those. Uh, but while you're looking for them, might as well get any security updates that came from something else. Uh, SSH does not use the this portion of SSL, 
So it's not susceptible. So, unless you made th changes just to add that for some reason. Okay. Um, the second thing, as I said earlier, be glad this is free software. This is software that can be audited, can be studied, and they can't ignore the bug. They can't try to suppress it. Once it was found, company the, the software uh, uh, project was given a little bit of notice. Unfortunately, due to some miscommunication, the notice, they didn't get the full notice because they actually had a few days notice and it came out quicker. Um, but they could not have kept it quiet any longer than that few days of notice. Um, so we found out about this and we so we can fix it. If we hadn't found out about it, it could just be sitting there for months and years, as often happens with non-free software. Uh, third, if you're not using a pa password manager like KeePassX, this is a really good opportunity to start because um, you're going to need to change a lot of passwords. Um, so I recommend using a password manager. Uh, KeePassX is the one I use. It's free software. There are other groups out there. LastPass is a commercial service uh, that has been making some some uh, uh, ways with this. Um, but there are lots of other things. If you look for a password manager for the platform you're on, you should be able to get something. Um, if you do log in from your desktop and your phone, then look for something that will work on both. KeePassX does not work on the phone. However, it uses a file format for which there are Android and iPhone applications that read that same format. Uh, so you can use that. Um, if you want more information about KeyPa uh, Password Manager, come to next month's talk. Okay, so what do you need to do for your passwords? So this is, I'm going to give you a laundry list real quick. I'm going to follow this up with a blog post, which will allow you to, to read things in, in time. Um, for each site that you're concerned about, iterate over this list. Uh, the first thing is, uh, verify, verify the site is not vulnerable. Vulnerable. There are several tools out there, including a couple of different web pages. You can paste the domain in, and it will come back and tell you whether or not the site is vulnerable. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether it was fixed or whether it wasn't vulnerable to begin with. It will just tell you they are currently not vulnerable or they currently are vulnerable. Um, no, no, going and changing your password for a site that's still vulnerable doesn't help you. If they're still vulnerable, don't log in until they fix their site. Whatever they are, right? Uh, and if it's a site that you need life or death, contact them and tell them to fix their stuff. And, you know, tell them there are plenty of people out there who, for a little, a little bit of consulting, will help them if they're not capable themselves. All right. Um, then, if you're logged in, log out. Because if you continue with the current session, that session can be hijacked. So, log out. Now, if you log back in, and a site that is not vulnerable, at least they can't hijack your session. They might already have your credentials and be able to log in on their own, but they won't be able to read what you're doing back and forth, which is, is an important part, because if you're going to change your password, you want to make sure it's not on a big postcard like last month's presentation so that other people can see it. All right. Um, if you know how to do this, and if you don't, you really should learn this anyway, but delete cookies for the site. Regular web cookies, but also flash cookies. Uh, and any other, the, uh, the whatever they call flash cookies and stuff. Delete those because those can have information that, again, can be used for reconnecting, re-establishing a session that, if somebody else knows the information, can be hijacked. So you want to you want to make sure that those are not in place. So once you've got clean, uh, and if you're if you're uncertain about that, with your with your web browser, if it supports creating new profiles, create a brand new profile. That gets rid of your regular cookies. Your flash cookies, unfortunately, can kind of bleed between profiles. Um, so you'll have to you'll have to learn a little bit more about that if you want to get those out. Anyway, so start with a fresh browser, no no cookies. Log in using your old credentials because that's what you have. Once you've logged in, change your password. Change it immediately so that, that the old credentials can no longer be used. Um, use a password generator to create a nice long you know, password so you've got a good secure password. If, if your old password was the, the name of your firstborn, don't switch to the name of your secondborn. Sounds cool, but you know it's really, <laughs> really not a secure way to go for passwords. Um, Again, use a password manager. If it's really long and ugly, it doesn't matter if it's a password manager. You never need to see it. Um, if you're putting this into a password manager, once you've created the new password and, say, and, and created the entry for that, save the file so that if you, if you forget, you know, if you, your computer crashes or something like that, 
you don't no longer have credentials, right? You want to save it, make sure you've got credentials. All right. Um, if the site has a PIN, so for instance, financial institutions, you have your password, you might also have a PIN that is used and is accessible via the website. If you do, change that as well. Uh, if you can, make it a five or six digit number instead of a four digit number, like most PINs are four digits. Turns out they actually, in most cases, will, will um, allow five or six digits. They won't say that. Um, so if you can, do that because it makes it harder for somebody to crack. Plus, most places that are looking for it are just trying to crack four digit PINs, so you already get yourself out of most attempts at your PIN by moving to a non four digit uh, number. Don't move to three, that would be bad. Yes, Len? Does that work on the machines that Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's if your card or whatever it is that, we're, that you would have the pin, if the software behind it supports the five digit or six digit, then the interface as well as well. So the credit card industry actually has a six digit uh, um, number as their standard. It's just that most places only use four digits. Or that's what they default to, and they don't tell anybody that you can go more. Yes. Um, and the only reason I know that is because I actually semi worked in the industry for a while. So, uh, and, and wish we would move to that. Again, make sure you change, save, if you're using Password Manager to, to store all this, make sure you save it after you add new data to it so you don't lose the, the information. Uh, no, you don't have to use your name. Uh, well, we'll get the, yeah, for, for that. Um, so yeah, if you, if you can change, this is probably my talk for next month. Um, but if you've got if you've got your choice of what your username is, make that a random string as well. If you're using a password manager, it doesn't matter, right? So I have actually for one of my financial institutes, I have a completely random string. The only issue I have is when I paste that in to log in, I'm like, was that the username or was that the password? <laughs> I look, it's shorter, so I know it was the username instead of the password. But it's I couldn't pronounce it if I had to. Um, so if the site has security questions or anything else that can be used to access your account, whether that by being, being by calling up and saying, hey, I'm me, would you let me have information? Um, so social engineering or whether they could actually be used to get a password set. So anything like that, change those. Don't just change the answers to the security questions, but change the actual security questions if you can. Because again, if your account was compromised, somebody else can have access to all that. So if you go change your password, but leave a way for them to get around your password, you're not actually secure. Right? You just think you are. Uh, so change all those. Again, you can put that in the password manager as well. There's a lot of information. You should have different information on every site. And by the way, lie on your security questions. What was your, your dog's, you know, your first dog's name? Make something up. Make it a random string. They don't need to know what the answer is. All they're looking for is an answer that's unique. Certain social media companies might actually know the answer to that question, but the rest of them shouldn't. And even the social media companies don't need to know. They just think they do. So make stuff up. But you need to make sure you've got it in the password manager and you, you have good backups for that password manager, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you're safe from there. All right. Um, any questions? <laughs> And then check any notification mechanisms for the site. So if they've got a way to email you, if they've got a way to send you physically things, so they know what your email address is, your physical address, your phone number, uh, they know, I don't know, the, the secret combination to your tattoo, whatever it is that they might know uh, that can be used to contact you or that can be used to get into their site, go make sure that only your information is on there. Uh, you know, make sure that they can't be sending these vegetarian lambs to somebody else's house. I mean, yes, we want to help third world countries and everything, but not necessarily off of your credit card and your personal account. So, uh, so that's the the quick and dirty, or as quick as I could make it anyway, uh, mech is, uh, uh, thing for securing. Do that for every site that you've used, you know, secure site that you've used in the last week, um, and maybe go through and do that for everything else. You should be changing passwords and, and information like that and auditing your accounts on a regular basis anyway. So maybe just use this as an opportunity to go through and do a full-scale audit and then schedule another one for three to six months down the road and maybe not do all of them every time but stagger so you get through them all in a, in a year or something. Uh, and those that matter the most, for instance, your bank, um, you might want to do on a more regular basis uh, because if, you're, if somebody can just make sure your paycheck goes to Belize every month, 
that might not work out well for you. All right. Any questions? Okay. On the surface side, I understand that um, this is all uh, resolved with a option called the heartbeat, mm -hmm. and that if you disable the heartbeat option, that well, let's let's go ahead and stop because this is a talk about the desktop side. Um, but I will semi preempt your question just a little bit, just in case this covers it. The only way to disable the heartbeat is to recompile with the heartbeat option disabled. Um, so that's one of the reasons why this is an issue. It wasn't a configuration change. We had to go through and do upgrades. Uh, everyone. The upgrades are available, so they're so they're there. But yeah, there's 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 a there's a few things you can do. You can actually block the heartbeat information at the at a router, most likely. Um, but the main thing is sites need to upgrade and and take care of that. Um, if we have questions about, uh, uh, do you have think of questions later on about what I just talked about, or you have server side questions, uh, we can cover those when we go over for food. Um, you know, that's we we always talk about different things. That's a great opportunity to talk about it. Yes, sir. Probably also important to make sure that the browser has. Uh, Oh, thank you. Okay. Good point. So, so Austin's point was that you need to make sure your browser has certi certificate revocation enabled. I would hope that's the default everywhere. It, oh, they, they should know better too. Yeah. Yeah. So the the roots, are, if the roots are going through and and because when you're going up that that way, yeah. But your point is 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 good because we should have that enabled anyway. Um, so the point is that so you've got a certi certificate which is what can be stolen via this this bug. Um, and that is, is valid for a certain period of time. So if I go buy one today, it is valid for a year. Longer if I've paid for longer than a year. Um, so it, it expires a year from today. But if by, if it gets, if it gets compromised tomorrow, we don't want it to stay in, in effect for another 364 and a quarter days. We want to say this one's done because we know that it's been compromised. Uh, and that's what Austin is talking about is that in the browser, you need to enable certificate revocation, so that way I can send out a notice saying, hey, by the way, the certificate that I said yesterday is really good is not. Please don't use it. Yes, Mitch. There is, um, there are lots of evidence that since it came out, people have been able to use it to gather information. So we can prove without a doubt that it can be used to gather information. It doesn't leave any traces. Either. Doesn't leave any traces, so we can't tell if people have or haven't been doing unless you have certain types of IDS logs that we can go through. That said, there have been two cases now where uh, somebody has said, "Hey, my IDS logs show that this has been being used." One was from last month, and the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Great resource for information about this right now, by the way, uh, EFF.org. Um, EFF pointed out that what that guy was seeing could be caused by a certain scanning tool. And not only could it be caused by a certain scanning tool, but what he was seeing matches exactly what you would get from that scanning tool. And therefore, what he's seeing is probably from the scanning tool. The other one is from November of last year, so five months ago, six months ago. Um, and that one right now looks like that was actually exploiting the bug to gather information from uh, his company. Um, so it's not confirmed yet. However, it looks like there's a decent chance, at least in uh, November. If you or anybody you know runs an IDS intrusion detection system and has logs, Please contact me or contact the EFF directly. They would love to talk to you and love to have you search your logs. They don't want to search your logs. Well, maybe they do, but they will let. They, I will ask you to search your logs 
for certain fingerprints within those logs. And if those fingerprints show up, then there's a good chance that's an indication that the exploit was being tried against your your site. Um, so, like I say, if you or anybody you know has IDS logs, if you you know if you know somebody that does security at a big company that might have a, a IDS stuff, please have them contact the EFF and and uh, give us further information. So, yes. We don't we don't use HTTPS for general public anyway, so there was really no compromise. the The plug website was using the the compromise one of the compromised versions open SSL, um, but the only person that could affect is Brian because he's the only one that has credentials to log in. Um, well, actually, Brian and Larry. Larry's not going to use his. Um, I don't know if you have credentials. Okay, so there's only a few people because we basically got it as a, as a read only instance. But yes, we did go through an update. Um, it was my understanding that the vulnerability would produce kind of random. Let's let's take this to to afterwards, or and if you're not going for food, we can we can discuss it here before we take off. Okay, just because I want to give everybody else a chance to type it. So thanks for your patience and, and everything, and we'll go ahead and let Jerry come up and talk about something cool that's not paranoia. <laughs> Thank you. All right.